Hey, it's Kat and I'm back because what once was will be again. I do not have my thinking hat on. I have my glasses because I was doing some reading and research so that we can use history, mythology, and astrology to divine the mysteries of the Game of Thrones. So in this series, we're going to talk about the name Targaryen and what its actual meanings are because Targaryen can actually be parsed into two words, Targ and Aryan. Now, a Targ was a round shield and it was super popular across the known world, but most people associate it with the Scandinavians or the Vikings. And Aryan comes from the root word Arya or Arya, which means noble. And Aryan actually means the noble people. And it's Sanskrit, and it refers to a Indo-Iranian people who lived around the borderlands of Iran and North India, as well as Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and areas within. So the name Targaryen is actually two words put together that represents an idea. Now, Mr. Martin actually called this out when he gave Aegon Targaryen, the conqueror of Westeros, a particular title. And one of his titles, in fact, was the shield of his people, Targaryen. We get this idea repeated back to us by Aegon's first name, which actually has at its root A-E-G, age. And this root has two different foundations. One, age is also the root for goat. It's a Greek term for goat. And age or Aegeus was a goat herder who was the founder of Athens. You get the goat herders. The Valyrians were actually goat herders who founded Valyria. Then Aegis also reflects upon two different shields. So the first Aegis that we're kind of familiar with is that Zeus had a goat skin, speaking of goats and Aegis, that was very tough and protected his neck. The second one is Aegis and goes directly back to this shield that it was an Aegis which Athena gave to Perseus, which he used in order to defeat the Gorgon Medusa. So the woman with the snakes on her head, he used this shield that was made of goat skin that was very tough and it was covered with bronze to reflect back her image and prevent her from turning him to stone. So Aegis was a shield. Aegon, the shield of his people, Targaryen. Now back to the root of the Targaryen name, Arian. So the Arians were a noble people from the Indo-Iranian area. And historically, they are believed to have immigrated across Asia and into Europe. And their traditions and religions are found to have been translated to many of the tribes that they integrated with and or where they were the founding members. One of those traditions and or religious ideas is the idea of the 12 gods. Now, in the Vedic tradition of the Aryan people, the 12 gods were the 12 Adityas, who were the children of Dias, the sky father, and Prithi, who was the mother earth. And we can find this across many other cultures, from the Babylonians to the Assyrians, and in particular the Greeks, where we find the 12 gods of Olympus as well as the Assyrian gods of the Norse. Many of these gods translate directly. For instance, Dias, the sky god, could be associated with Zeus or Jupiter, or even Odin, the Allfather, who lives in Assyr. <laughs> there is also the god of thunder and weather and thunderbolts. And this translates also to Zeus, but may also be seen as Thor, who is the god of thunder with his hammer. And there is also the god of the underworld. And these are seen in the Babylonian and Assyrian uh, religions as well as the Greek. And he almost translates perfectly to the god Hades, who is the god of the underworld. Now these 12 Adityas gave birth to a number of demigods. Among these are the Divas, who are thought to be the good spirits, as well as the Asuras, who are thought to be the bad spirits. But of course, both of these are considered to contain both aspects of the good and bad, which is very similar to the concepts of yin and yang, or balance, as well as karma. And this is where we get karma coming around to bite our characters in the Game of Thrones, where whatever sins they committed come back around to get, bite them in the end. Among these asuras, or demigods, were the Danavas. 
The Danavas were considered malevolent spirits. These were the children of Danu. She was a water goddess, and she gives her name to rivers such as the Dnieper or the Danube, as well as many others across the world. Among Danu's children were Vitra, as well as Vala. Now, Vitra is a dragon, and his name actually means firstborn among the dragons. And Vala means enclosure, and he was the god who had a cave, and in this cave he imprisoned the dawn. So now you get that Danu was the mother of dragons, or Daenerys, the mother of dragons. Feature the dragon, who was considered a blocker, who prevented the waters of life from flowing forward, as well as Vala, his brother, who had imprisoned the dawn, were defeated by the lord or king of the divas, the king of the gods, Indra. I think we can clearly see the idea of Vala in the word Valyrian. So Vala being the person or thing that captured the dawn, and the Valyrians also having the word Arian being of the Aryan people. So in other words, the Valyrians are somehow holding the dawn as a prisoner. In order to defeat Vritra as well as Vala, Indra is said to have drank Soma. And Soma is actually a mythological trinity or unity of God, plant, and drink. So three. And he became inebriated on the Soma, and it gave him the power to defeat the dragon as well as the Vala. Indra is said to have resided on Mount Meru. And just like many other mythologies and traditions across the world, it is said that he brought the heroic dead to live in his halls forever and watch games and live and eat. Very much like the idea of Valhalla, for the Norse mythology and or the Greek Elysium fields. Now, Mount Maru is said to have been in one of the levels of the seven heavens. So in the Vedic tradition, there are seven heavens and there are seven hells. And we get this played out in our story over in Westeros amongst the faith of the seven, where there is an epitaph of seven heavens as well as seven hells. And in one case, one of our characters actually said this, epitaph of seven hells and someone responded to him that you are living in the seven hells. In the Vedic tradition, the seven heavens and the seven hells act as repositories for good and bad spirits. So if you are somewhat good, you may go to the seven heavens and you will repeat your life until you attain such spiritual enlightenment that you can finally reach the top penultimate level resided over by Dias, and there your spirit could finally rest. Likewise, if you are particularly bad, you might actually spend a considerable amount of time in the seven hells, likewise repeating your life until you um, have a spiritual attainment that allows you to reach a level of the seven heavens. The lowest level of the seven hells was occupied by the Nagas. And the Nagas were a serpent or dragon people. They were half people, half dragon. And we see this repeated in our Norse mythology where Nagas is the dragon that lives at the bottom of the tree of all life and is said to be continuously eating at the root of the tree. Naga also makes an appearance in our story of A Song of Ice and Fire. Naga was the sea serpent or sea dragon which the Grey King ended up defeating in order to take possession of the Ironborn Islands. The Grey King used her bones to build his castle and her eternal fire to heat it until eventually the Storm God came along and <laughs> drowned out her fire with his rain and waves. And I think this is a portender for our friend Euron who is the Storm King, or styling himself the Storm God, who probably will end up killing one of the dragons and or being the cause of Daenerys' dragon fire being put out, by the way. Returning once more to Indira, Indra is often paired with his two twin brothers, Mrita and Varuna. Now, Mrita and Varuna together represent the idea of balance, 
as well as the timing of the planets and the rising of the sun, etc., etc. Mrita by himself is considered the undeveloped, or his name means to die and then to be resurrected or reborn again. And when he's paired with Indra, it means that Indra will rise again. So even though Indra drinks Soma, which makes him immortal, he can die, but he is resurrected, very much like we see our friend Jon Snow. <laughs> then we have the pairing of Indra with Varuna. And this one is also very interesting because Varuna is the god of the sea and the waterways, but he's also considered the god uh, that is the keeper of the oaths, as well as the god of thresholds. And his vehicle, or Vahana, is a crocodile-looking-like creature. And we find this in our story of A Song of Ice and Fire, where the Kranich men have for their shield, or sigil, a crocodile eating its own tail, and that they are said to be the keepers of the threshold. So they reside and or defend the north at the threshold of the neck, and this keeps people from being able to invade the country. We get this idea repeated to us when Jojen and Mira show up and come to see Bran, and they give him an oath. They said it's the traditional oath of the Kranich men to the Starks. And this oath has them swearing by sky and by earth, by water and by wind, by iron and by bronze, as well as by ice and fire. So if you understand what they're saying here, is that no matter what aspect the Starks, or particularly Bran, will be fighting on, whether ice and fire, the Kranich men, or the House Reed, will be following them. So at first, when they have to be ice in order to defeat the fire, and then when they have to become fire to drive the ice back, the Kranich men will be following them regardless of which side they play on. Returning again to Varuna, when Indra is paired with Varuna, it is said that they bring in the new year or the new age, because Varuna, along with his brother Marita, are the gods of balance, but also order and law. So when Indra comes with Varuna, they bring in a new age. Circling back to the Aryan in the Targaryen and the Valyrian, clearly Mr. Martin is making a reference to the Aryan people, who are the Indo-Iranian people who immigrated across Asia and into Europe, which is, appears to be the similar pattern in which the Valyrians, whose name were not Valyrians before, but probably came from the Ashai slash Yt area, and then finally settled over in the area they called Valyria. Now, this also makes reference to the idea of the Aryans being a particular pure race. This comes from the 19th century research of a man called Garbineau, in that he claimed that the Aryans were probably a blonde-haired and blue-eyed race of people because they claimed to be descended from the gods, and many of their gods, in fact, were golden-haired and golden-skinned with blue eyes. And this unfortunately gave rise to the Nazi ideology, wherein the Aryans were believed to be, the Germans were believed to be the direct descendants of the Aryans and the inheritors of their race, and the Germans attempted to purify their bloodlines by promoting such ideas as Lebensbrom, where they said the perfect Aryan was a blonde and blue-eyed man or woman, and they encouraged them to have as many children as possible to create this super race that one, one day rule mankind. It was the Nazis and their Aryanism idealism that began the race for the atomic weapon, the most feared weapon of mass destruction on earth. As we see the Valyrians having created or hatched the dragons created their own WMD. And in both cases, the Germans and the Valyrians basically instigated their own near extinction by promoting this pursuit. The Valyrians also represent the Aryans in, or the Aryanism in terms of their pursuit of the purity of their race or line, in fact that they intermarried or interbred amongst themselves. But let us acquit Mr. Martin of promoting Aryanism because he clearly points out that it results in megalomania, insanity, birth defects, and the near destruction of their own people. We'll be back with part two of this section, but thank you very much. Hit the like button, make a comment. I'll be talking to you later.